put the who's in on the whatsy. Attach the whatsy to the who'sy. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacallit. Hey everybody, welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. Uh, so, you can see from the title of this episode, I'm going to be talking about the unfair child, the undertone audio unfair child. I know a lot of you have mentioned that you enjoy the fact that I'm not on this YouTube channel selling stuff. Well, I'm going to sell something. <laughs> I'm going to try and sell unfair childs now. <laughs> um, you know, my, the fine folks over at Undertone Audio were like, hey, you should probably try and sell some undertone audio stuff on your YouTube channel. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, I'm at least going to be super upfront about it. Um, and it's easy for me to do because I genuinely love this thing. Uh, I put a lot of effort into um, building it and I use it all the time. If you've been watching other episodes, I'm sure you're, you've seen that I use it on a lot of stuff. Vocals and drums and guitars and all over the place. Um, and I use it a lot because it's sounds awesome and I, I I genuinely love it so um so it's definitely sincere I'm not here just shilling things that I don't care about um but if you're not into being sold something you can just go ahead and skip this um and I'm going to try and you know make it interesting I'll talk about like the features and the design of the thing and all that stuff and um I'm also going to pull up a bunch of audio examples um, from stuff that I've worked on and try and just show it in every sort of, you know, possible context. I'll put it on a, a, a whole mix of some uh, instrument, you know, a mix of music and then uh, individual tracks. I have like acoustic guitar and bass and lead vocals, um, distorted guitar, electric guitar, uh, drum mix, all, you know, individual kick and snare stuff, like tons of stuff to check it out on. So. Um, all from uh, <coughs> projects that I've worked on. So there might be some interesting things in there for those of you that are here just to check out recordings of things and stuff. Um, so here we go, me selling Unfair Child. Yay, here it comes. So here it is. Dun, 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 dun. You can see my hand pointing at it there. Dun, dun, dun. Um, so this is the Unfair Child 670M Mark II. We had made an, uh, a first version of this, the version one. And uh, it used different tubes in the main audio path. It used six BC-8s instead of the original style 6386s. That was because at the time when we built the first one, um, nobody was making 6386s and there was a huge supply of surplus six BC-8s. So we uh, you know, altered the circuit so it would work with the six BC-8s. It was a cool version of it. But then not long after we finished that, the company JJ started making 6386s and so for the second version, we converted things back to, you know, work with the 6386 again. It was a good change. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy with this, with this last version. There was a, you know, a, a few things that were added, you know, with the functionality and just the sound of the, uh, the original 6386 type tubes is just incredible. So this version is, um, I like to say, as close to an original Fairchild as they are to each other um, because I've used at least half a dozen different original Fairchilds, they all sounded totally different. Um, none of them <laughs> sounded even a little bit similar. And so, you know, this one sounds as much like the sound of an original one as the original ones do themselves. You know, they've all sort of drifted or have been modded or changed around or whatever. And so um, it's a really, re you know, an amazing representation of that original circuit. Um, and the, the only thing is that we, you know, uh, added a bunch of features that you would expect in a modern compressor. So here are the features of this thing. So starting with um, this uh, simple control, this just controls what you're seeing in the meters and it also functions as a bypass, you know, so you can bypass the thing. And um, it's, a, it's a hard bypass where, you know, essentially the cables that are plugged into the input just get connected to the cables that are plugged into the output. It's just straight through, no active electronics in there at all. Um, oddly enough, the original Fairchild did not have a bypass on it. <laughs> Could you imagine now, you know, paying $50,000 for one of these things and there's no bypass on it? Um, the other thing it didn't have was output level metering. Uh, and so this VU mode um, will show you what level is coming out of this device. Um, the original Fairchild, it only showed you a couple things with the meters that were on there. It showed gain reduction and uh, then it had a balancing mode where you could 
uh, balance the tubes. Uh, so we have the gain reduction um, mode, you know, so the, uh, the meters will zero out and it'll show you dB of gain reduction. Uh, it's pretty accurate. It's, it's difficult to get with, with very few tubes to get the scale of the VU to match exactly. You know, that's easy to do if you're building a compressor that's a VCA um, type compressor with tubes, not, not so easy to make that absolutely perfect. It's very, very close and the, and the meters are definitely totally useful. And um, you know, once you get used to the ballistics of them, um, uh, give, give you a lot of good information about how hard you're really hitting things. But um, if you're expecting this, you know, when it goes to minus seven to be exactly seven dB down, tubes just don't really work that way. So, um, and then we have the balancing mode, just like the original Fairchild did. Um, and so <clears throat> the Verimu tubes have two sides to them and uh, it's a push-pull circuit. They need to be balanced with each other. If they're not, then you get a bunch of weird artifacts in the compression. You get some weird thumping sounds and distortion and stuff. And so it's important to make sure the two sides are balanced. It's super, super easy on this device. You just put it in the balancing mode. Here's the balancing trim pot. And you just turn the pot until it's as low as it'll go. There's gonna be like a null point where it just totally nulls out. Bumping up like that, you're balanced. Easy peasy. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the gain reduction mode, uh, that's also calibratable. Boop, 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 dun, dun, dun. So you can make sure that, uh, you know, zero, it's starting from um, an accurate zero point. Uh, so then we have input gain, and uh, the input gain on this is actually really just a passive attenuator. And the way the circuit works, um, depending on how you sort of set, set things up generally, um, the, the Verimu tubes, there's four Verimu tubes in parallel. Um, that is the sum total of the active circuitry for the audio path in this thing and they will add gain to, um, to the signal. And so they, on average, are adding about 12 dB of gain, the way we set up the, um, um, the circuit on this particular version of it. And so when you're at 12 on the input gain control with no um, compression going on or anything, this is the way it gets calibrated when it leaves the factory, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, it'll be unity gain. So minus 12, you're doing 12 dB of padding that is essentially compensating for the 12 dB of gain that's being added all the time by the tubes. And so you can, um, you know, turn, basically remove the pad and have 12 dB of gain and hit the, uh, the compression circuit uh, a little harder. Uh, so that's how this works. And it's really kind of the thing that's I think is the most extraordinary about the Fairchild design in general is that the audio path is extremely simple. It really is just a transformer, a passive attenuator, then four very mu tubes in parallel, the 6386s, and then a transformer and an output. That's it. That's the entire audio path on this thing. There's, I don't think any other tube compressor on the planet that is streamlined and simple as that audio path. All the complicated stuff is in the sidechain circuit, the part of it that actually triggers it to compress. It has the time constant controls and all of that stuff. That's where the, the complicated stuff happens. Audio path, extremely simple, and it's part of why this thing I think is so beautiful and musical sounding. Um, so then we have a threshold control here, and so basically all this thing is doing is just turning level up going into the sidechain circuit. And so you're just turning up the volume of the signal that's going into the sidechain circuit that triggers it to compress. And so you can just turn that up. It'll, the more it goes up, the more it compresses. Um, this, not, this control is also detended. Every single control on this device is detended for people that might be using it for mastering and want to be able to recall settings and stuff like that. Um, so then we have the channel mode. So it's, it's a two-channel device. There's a channel A and a channel B. When you're an individual, um, it will <coughs> behave as if it's just two mono compressors. Um, you can set them totally independently, all that. When it's in link mode, it will stereo link them together. This is another thing that surprisingly the original Fairchild did not have. <laughs> it was a two channel device, the original Fairchild 670, not stereo linkable. It had this like, 
lateral vertical thing um, that was really for cutting vinyl. Um, it was like an MS type compression thing because um, uh, vinyl stuff is, is broken up into uh, the uh, vertical, which is mono information, and lateral, which is the stereo information. So, um, so you could uh, you know, compress those, those signals individually. So we have that as well. The MS mode on here is essentially the same as the lateral vertical mode on the original Fairchild. I think a lot of the original Fairchilds did get modified so they would do proper um, stereo, uh, stereo linked compression, but um, originally didn't have it. So um, the MS mode is interesting. So then what happens is channel A is compressing all the mono information and channel B is compressing all the stereo information in an MS you know, uh, encoded signal. Um, the encoding is done with the transformers. You can get access to all of the different phasings of the signal that you need in order to be able to break it up into mono and stereo information. Um, and so you can do that exactly the same way it did on the original Fairchild with the lateral vertical thing. The, the thing that was always kind of weird about this to me is that when you start compressing mono stuff different than stereo stuff and the volume relationship between those two signals is changing, um, that means that your stereo image is fluctuating. And I always thought like, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure I really want my stereo image to be fluctuating. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, that doesn't sound like a great thing to have happen. And so we added uh, another thing called MS Link. And so that means that this threshold control is triggering how much the device is triggering compression from the mono information. This threshold control is controlling how much the device is triggering compression from the stereo information. And then the volume controls remain independent of each other, but the mono and stereo information will always compress together. And so what you can do is you can have a setting where it's like, ah, I want this mix to compress a little bit more off the mono information, not as much off the stereo information. And I can also do a thing where I'll turn down the mono signal a little bit and have the stereo signal a little higher and um, widen the stereo image and it'll stay wide. It's, it's not going to be fluctuating. So in the MS mode, you can actually use this as a stereo image widening device as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, so then uh, that's a stereo link. So then we get into um, the uh, time constants. And so we have the original um, six presets that were on the original Fairchild. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right there. You can call them up. They sound, you know, pretty much just like the original Fairchild. Um, and so one and two were very useful. It's a pretty fast attack time. Um, and for, it's the same attack time for both of those. It's just a little slower release on two. And then when you get to number three, the attack slows down a little bit. The release gets even longer. When you get into like four and five, the release is really long um, to a point where it's kind of unusable to me. Um, I've never really found much use for presets four and five. And then six is like this auto leveling thing where um, it has uh, an, a, a slow sort of gain reduction control where um, if there's a section that is, you know, on average louder, the whole thing will sort of hover lower, but then the, the quicker bursts of level will get um, attenuated more quickly in that range. And so it does sort of like more an auto gain control kind of thing. Um, that, can, that can be useful on some stuff. I've, I've used it. So then those are the six presets. On the original Fair, Unfair Child that we did, um, I just added more presets that I thought were missing, you know, generally like slower attack times with faster release times. Um, that was the one thing that they really didn't have represented anywhere uh, on the original six presets. So, um, so instead of that, this time I decided screw presets. I just want to be able to set the attack and release time like a normal human being using a compressor. Um, and so that's what these variable modes are. And the way the timing circuitry works on a Fairchild is Basically, it's a combination of a capacitor and resistor. And the capacitor affects both the attack and the release times. As the, the capacitor gets bigger in value, both the attack and release will get slower and slower and slower. Um, resistors you can use 
to slow down individually the attack or release time. And so each of these presets, these six presets, is a combination of a capacitor and some resistors that created a combination of an attack time and release time that they thought was musical and useful. And so what we did is these variable positions, these are capacitors. And so you're basically calling up capacitors that double in size with each progressive setting. And the first position, that capacitor, is half the size of the capacitor that they use for preset one on the original Fairchild. So when you're in variable one, you can have an attack time that's twice as fast as anything that happened on an original Fairchild. And so then the attack and release controls down here, these are resistors that you can use to modify individually the attack or the release. And so if you want to have a combination of a very fast attack or, or release with a slower of one or the other, then you can put it in variable one and you could have, let's say, like a really, really fast release time, but slow down the attack time resistively here. Um, or you could go the other way around, have a really, really fast attack time and a really slow release time. And then each time you go up, both the attack and release time will get slower and put you sort of in a different range of adjustment for the individual resistive controls. And so it was really the only way that I could get all any possible combination of capacitive and resistive time constant control uh, on the unit. And some, some of these are duplicatable. So like if you go to variable three, I believe there's a setting somewhere on these guys. Um, if you slow down variable one, it'll give you um, numerically the same time constant as variable three, but it does sound a little bit different. The way, the slope of how the timing gets um, introduced is a little different if it's done by a resistor rather than a capacitor. So there is that as well. And um, I'm a super duper control freak. I like to have every option. Um, and uh, it's been really cool playing with all the different combinations of this stuff to find something that really like um, fits perfect like with the tempo and you know um, feel of the music. Um, it's extremely flexible and you know when you get all the way up into variable four and slow things down it's it's really really slow you can have stuff that's just you know hovering around for just waiting forever for uh, <clears throat> to come back up. So it's a massive amount of control. The fastest setting is extremely fast um, because the preset, even preset number one, um, that was its fastest, fastest attack time. They had added resistors to the release on that one, so the release was a lot slower. So when you're in variable one and both of these are all the way up, the attack and release are both incredibly fast. Um, and so <clears throat> it's an interesting setting because um, when the attack and the release are happening that quickly, they can start to modulate each other and, uh, and it ends up sounding like distortion in certain circumstances. So you have to be careful, you know, there is definitely a way to set this thing so it just sounds kind of distorted and weird, but some of us like weird distorted stuff and it can be cool for that. So, um, so there you go, that's the time constant thing, tons of flexibility there. Then the DC threshold, so this at the end of the day ends up behaving like a, um, a ratio control and so the varimu tubes have a curve to them and as you get higher and higher in the curve and the slope sort of flattens out it, what it's indicating is that it's becoming a harder and harder knee and um, and it becomes more like a limiter so like <clears throat> up up here if you cross the threshold point it just holds it in place down here if it crosses the threshold point then it'll you know, for every dB you go above, it'll turn it down a half dB, or if it goes two dB above, it'll turn it down one dB, you know, so it's a more gentle knee there, and when you get up here, it's more limited. Um, and so I have some examples of how that actually sort of manifests when you're setting things, you know, for vocals or whatever. Um, so that was a thing that was on the original Fairchild, but it, it was buried inside the device, um, and it was something that was like a calibrated setting that you would just set one time and leave it, um, it's way too useful. Uh, I, I wanted to put it out on the front of the, um, the you know, the user control so you, you can actually uh, change the ratio on the thing. Um, so we have those and then there is um, 
side chain insert. So you can actually, um, you know, EQ the side chain on this compressor the way you would on any, any other compressor. Uh, it's very, it's not uncommon for people to, you know, uh, EQ out some low end or high pass that signal. So it'll, it'll let more low end through, not trigger, you know, not compress as hard on the kick drum or whatever kind of mix. Um, so you can do that here. And then we realized there's another cool thing that you can do with the, um, the side chain insert. Because what's happening is um, this compressor, as it was originally designed, is a feedback compressor. And uh, if you're not familiar with um, what that is defining, it's basically that they're using the signal from the final output of the compressor to trigger the compression. So the same signal that's getting turned down by the compressor, which is kind of weird because what ends up happening is you go over the threshold point and it starts turning down the level and the source signal that's triggering the compression is what's getting turned down. And it was a way for the original designer to have this thing never over compress because it's as soon as it starts triggering compression, it turns down that source signal so it never grabs too hard. It's one of the things that's, another one of the things, that's really incredible about this device. I don't know if this is the first compressor that was done this way, but man, like you can just mash stuff through a Fairchild. Uh, bass guitars, vocals, drums, all kinds of stuff, and it gets super thick and crunchy and awesome, but it never like totally freaks out. Because um, the Varimu tubes, even though um, they're more gentle than some other tubes that have been used in tube compressors, um, it's still, without feedback, man, they f freak out. They just totally go into what I call the black hole of compression. Um, and so, you, you know, the, the, the compressor is designed to be feedback, but with the side chain insert, you can turn it into a feed forward compressor. And so what happens is you just take a, a Y cable, a splitter of the input signal, um, one of the splits goes to the actual inputs of the unfair child. The other splits go to the return of the side chain. And so then the input signal is what's triggering the, the compression instead of the output signal. And so then the compressor has no awareness of how much it's compressing. It just triggers compression off of the input signal. And so it'll definitely totally freak out and do this like just disappear into a black hole compression thing. Um, but it can also be a really cool, aggressive sound um, in a really interesting way that just sort of like only grabs and creates these like punchy, aggressive attacks on things. Um, it can be more similar to other feed forward compressors like a, you know, DBX160. Um, a lot of VCA compressors are feed forward. Um, but it's, it's more organic sounding because it's like, you know, it's doing it with 14 tubes instead of a VCA. So it's a cool thing. We're going to have some, some examples of that. Um, so one of the other things that we did is um, the original Fairchild did not have a way to trim the gains of the left and right signals or channel A and channel B. You know, if you're using it as a stereo compressor, it's important to match the left and right sides. It was an incredible pain in the ass um, when I was using original Fairchilds and stuff because the chances of the four tubes on each of those sides coming up at exactly the same volume was volume was pretty much zero. Um, they would always be off by a little bit. And the gain control is in 1 dB steps, <laughs> and so you're not going to be able to fine-tune it in. And so um, I used to have to, like, put a fader, you know, patch a fader on the output of this thing in order to match up the levels um, on an original Fairchild uh, to deal with that. But this thing, we actually put gain trims on the device itself. You can match left and right exactly. So if you're using it on a stereo drum mix, your stereo mix bus or mastering or whatever, you can match it up really well. And we did it. I didn't want to add any circuitry to this thing um, in, able to, uh, in order to do that. And so there's a cool trick that you can do. Um, we added a control that's just adjusting the bias current on this device. And at the end of the day, when you change the bias current, it changes the overall gain of those tubes. And you have a range of about three or four dB that you can adjust. And we have a 10 turn pot there, so you can really fine tune it. The, the other thing that I realized is that when you change the bias current on these very mu tubes, it changes the character of the sound of the compression. And so it's a way to sort of, you know, change 
what type of a Fairchild sound you want, because I think different people set up the bias current differently on some of these things, or if you had different tubes, a different set of tubes, different manufacturing of tubes or whatever, they all sounded a little bit different. It's just one of the ways that you can have this device you know, um, sound one way or the other, uh, lean it one way or the other. At the lower bias currents, it's a little grabbier and you can hear it compress more. At the higher bias currents, um, you can, it's a little more open and just in your face sounding. So um, it's an interesting difference. I have a, an example on, of, of that on an acoustic guitar. So that is the basic overall settings on this thing. There's a, a bunch of calibration stuff on the back. Um, there's calibrations for the meters and everything. So this thing can really be set up to be an extremely accurate, reliable device, you know, if you're using it in a mastering context or on your mix bus or whatever. Um, I'm not getting into all the details of the calibration for the side chain and stuff like that right now, but um, it's there. It works great. You can match up the two sides really, really well. And um, this thing, you know, just performs beautifully when it's stereo linked and all of that stuff. But... Um, Let's get into hearing this on, to, on some stuff. How far are we into this? Yeah, we're 27 minutes into this thing, and um, <laughs> we haven't even heard it yet. So let's do that. I'm going to start off with it on a stereo mix, um, and i got to get my settings back here. Uh, I'm, I'm using this little guy. Uh, what do we got here? This is, yeah, here's the stereo one. We'll start with this. Just make sure I haven't totally screwed this up. I'm using the snapshot plugin to store my settings. Yep, those are back where they were. This is supposed to be seven. And this is ten. So this is seven. And this is ten. These were floored. That's always a good place to set just about everything. All the way up. Gotta love it. Okay, these were on variable two. We're stereo linked. And side chain is off. Okay, so then um, I have some some level offsets here. So for yeah, so we want to set this uh, about my six. So I can when I'm turning this thing on and off, they're at least somewhat similar in level. Um, so this is just the music part of a mix. This is um, a fine gentleman named Spencer Lee. This is his band, the Spencer Lee Band. Um, a song called The Wolf. Um, it, uh, he put out an EP. This is one of the things on there. And this was a mix where it was designed um, to have heavy, heavy compression on the whole mix. When you take the compression off, the dynamics are totally unwieldy and out of control, and everything sort of is pulled into focus by the unfair child on the whole mix. So <coughs> we'll start off hearing it with the unfair child on there so you can kind of get the idea of what this thing's about. There's a big old big downbeats going on here. Here it is. Okay, so now here's that same section, no compressor on there. So, I mean, it basically doesn't sound mixed <laughs> without the compression on the whole mix. And so here it is with it on there again. And, uh, I, you know, it does all of those things that, um, that you want a compressor to do. You hear those impacts are, are more powerful when things come in because... The compressor is going, whoa, and grabbing really hard, but, you know, the initial attack of when the music first comes in sort of sneaks through, and you get this big sort of aggressive punch right at the beginning. And then all of the in-between ambience and stuff gets pulled forward, you know, because it's the release is swelling back up and pulling all of that stuff forward. Um, and so this is a setting. I'm stereo-linked, feedback uh, compression. We'll check it out one more time, then we'll go to another another setting that's cool for this. without you know so it's a big difference it, it's it is the thing that makes this mix work you know it, this was mixed to be compressed um, like that so then I have another setting that is feed forward so let me set that up and we can check out the difference there so we go like this and here just just for fun 
I'll let you hear the black hole of compression because I'm going to have to tame these settings a whole lot <laughs> in order to get this work. But before I do, check out what, ha what happens. Yeah. Yeah, so the tubes just freak out at a certain point and just turn down way, way too much. Um, and the, the sound just completely disappears. It's essentially like a super, super extreme ratio um, that when you go past a certain point, it, it starts to just um, go beyond just limiting. Uh, it actually starts to turn things down beyond just keeping things at a level. Um, okay, so let me adjust these settings. So this goes way down here. Da, 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 to two and a half, and this goes to zero because we definitely don't need a higher ratio for this. Okay, let's see what this does. So this is feed forward compression now. Boop, got to do that. So it's interesting, like, you know, it's really just reacting very hard on the peak levels, but not compressing as much in between. Um, and so it's a, it's a different kind of feel to it. And in some ways, the feed forward thing actually can end up sounding a little bit less compressed, especially on the lower volume stuff, because it ends up just not touching it at all. Um, you can see on the lower passages in there, the meters are barely even moving. <clears throat> the meters are are barely even moving. You know, they're not compressing hardly at all at some of the um, the lower passage, the quieter passages in there. So yeah, one more time here, and then I'll 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 A B to uh, the uncompressed version. So there, there you go. Um, yeah, it's adding a lot of impact to that thing. Um, so now here's one more thing that was really cool to check out. Uh, MS mode. So you remember I was saying like, hey, I thought it would be really weird to um, have the mids and the sides, com you know, uh, compressing differently because your, you know, stereo image will be fluctuating. It turns out that can be really, really cool. And this is a pretty rad example of it. So this should be now MS style compression. Let's see what this sounds like. And it's, it's cool. You can hear, you know, in places where it does get wider, especially on those passages where the, the little guitar riff is happening. Those kind of come forward more and widen out. And in some ways, the whole thing feels a little less compressed. I'm, I think I'm actually going to, I don't know if that's setting, if I read that right, I'm going to ease off on that a little bit. Um, we'll hear it one more time. But like when it's not compressing everything together all the same way, you're, you're essentially like using two different compressors, one that's for like the kick and the snare and the bass and everything that's in the middle, and one that's for the guitars that are hard panned out and stuff like that. And so it, it's sort of break, you know, dividing out the compression duties between you know, mono and stereo stuff, and the whole thing ends up sounding a little more open to me some, somehow. And you can really see you know, the, the, the mono information, all those big downbeat compresses really hard. And the, this guy, like on those big hand claps and guitar riffs and stuff, the, the stereo stuff um, goes more. So that there's a good example of um, stereo linked um, feedback, stereo linked feed forward and MS. A uh, bunch of cool examples there. Let, uh, you know, I'll do the AB between the MS version and then nothing on there uh, with it bypassed. All right, cool. Um, 
Okay, so there it is, stereo mix. Let's get into some individual stuff. Um, I've got uh, an acoustic guitar here. And so, let's see, we'll turn that off. What is this? This is it. Okay. okay, yeah. So we'll hear this thing first, and then we'll I'll show you this other this other trick with it. Um, so this was like uh, an acoustic guitar track that was done on an early version of uh, one of Grace's songs um, on her record. And so it was just, I just recorded straight into the computer. I was just trying to figure out parts and stuff. So it was completely unprocessed, no compression, nothing. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so I just have like a, a little bit of EQ on there. And what is this guy? Yeah, a little brightening on there or mid-range. And then this is going to be the unfair child on there. And here is our settings. Let's see. I think I got all my settings here. Let's uh, let's hear what we got. So this is with the unfair child on there. Now, without the unfair child. Back with it again. So it's cool, it, you know, it adds all that sustain and, um, <coughs> and the attack has a good spank to it, you know, when you're really attacking the guitar, you hear it sort of have this aggressive just smack, you know, at the beginning of those chord hits. Um, uh, one of my very favorite sounds for acoustic guitar, uh, this really aggressive tube compression on it, you know, it reminds me of like David Bowie, Space Oddity, you know, that big acoustic guitar explosion that happens in that song. Um, so, or like, uh, yeah, Polythene Pam. I mean, I, that, that had to have been a Fairchild on that uh, on that acoustic guitar on the old Beatles song. Um, so then, check this out. This is a cool example of what this gain trim control does. So I'm going to play the same passage again. And right now, I have the bias current turned way down, so the thing's a little bit grabbier, and it sounds a little more like, you know, like an old dirty tube compressor to me. And as I turn it up, you'll hear it just kind of come forward and get a little cleaner and just more sort of, you know, um, strident sounding, just like right more in your face. Check it out. So there it is all the way up. So it's interesting, you know, it's like uh, when I turn that thing up, it's definitely more level for sure. Like there's more overall level, um, but it actually sounds less compressed. It's, it's less grabby to me and a little less crunchy sounding. It's just kind of more literal about what it's doing. It's just evening out the levels and, you know, and the guitar is just kind of, it's cleaner and just kind of right up in your face uh, for this particular thing. And, and I think I'd say a lot of the time what I really you know, going for with a tube compressor or limiter is to have it sound, you know, kind of cool and dirty with a lot of, a lot of um, character in it. And I hear more of that with, at the lower bias current. So here it is back down again. Sounds more explosive to me. So there you go, acoustic guitar and the two different gain trims. Just so you can see real quick how these gain trims are set up, I have a, a test tone set up in here. Um, I'll probably figure out a way to turn this down later on uh, so it doesn't annoy everybody 
horribly. Um, but here is the test tone. So there's a 1K test tone going here. And basically what happens is this is set up minus 18 with my converter it's sending a signal that is exactly plus four um, going to the unfair child. Uh, there's the unfair child uh, insert. So with no compression at minus 12, it's, I, I have the, the gain trim down a little bit, so it's a little below zero. But basically what you can do is if you want to have that clearer sound, you would basically, you know, turn this thing up a couple dB and just run your unity gain setting at minus 14 instead. Um, and so, and if you want it to be the sort of dirtier thing that I'm digging on this, you, know, you can turn this guy down, but you would run your in input gain a little hotter, you know, some, somewhere around there, something like that. So that's how you would, you know, calibrate this thing to be in uh, one range or another and have both sides match. You just send a test tone to it um, at plus four. Um, if you want it cleaner, you just set the input gain lower and set the gain trim higher. Or if you want it dirtier, set the input gain higher and the gain trim lower. All right, so moving on here. Okay, so this is um, guitars from the All American Rejects song, I Wanna. Uh, this was a big, you know, guitar thing at the, at the beginning of the, the song. Uh, so any of you that know that record, you'll, you'll recognize this immediately. Um, so this is with the Unfair Child on there. Let me make sure, let's see, I need to do a little level offset, try and match these up. So it should be about here. Boop, 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 okay. So check this out. There we go. Should be stereo. Okay, so then I'll take it off. So, a much softer attack, you know, on each of these, these hits overall. It just sounds more polite, you know. So that's with it. There it is without it again. And here it is. With it again. Just that really aggressive smack at the beginning of the guitars. Um, and so I, I also have a feed forward setting for this that we can check out. Uh, so here's that. Okay, so this is feed forward. And then without it. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's a similar thing. It's just more gentle sounding with, without the compressor on there. I think on, on this, I prefer the, um, the feed forward. Um, it's aggressive, but it doesn't, uh, it stays really big and, uh, and open sounding. It's, it's, I think it's better for this. So there it is on, you know, heavy, heavy distorted guitars. Um, it can be really cool for putting that smack on the beginning of, uh, you know, a guitar attack. Okay, so then we've got... Um, you know, I, I think I'll, there's one thing that's really interesting in here that, uh, while I have it up, we talked about this a little bit, um, in the All American Rejects episode, just highlight it real quick here because it's, it's kind of cool. We did this trick where, um, you put a sandbag on the sustain pedal of a piano, um, when it's in the room with other stuff and you basically use it as a reverb. And so the reverb that you're hearing on this.
So you can hear in there um, the, the strings of the piano resonating to notes that are being played in the guitar chords and just ringing out afterwards. And so you get this very tonal sort of resonant reverb that trails off after the guitar hits. Um, kind of a cool trick. Uh, I just thought I would mention that real quick as we're jamming through this here. Um, okay, so heavy guitars. What else we got in here? Let's do some bass. Okay, so here, I, I guess on this one, we'll start with it out the, the Unfair Child. Um, so here's this bass track. It's just a DI. It was printed, you know, with nothing on it. Just went through an undertone uh, DI input straight into the computer. So here it is with the Unfair Child. So um, pretty cool, you know, it, it um, totally thickens out the sustain of all those notes, um, gives you a nice little punch on the attack. You know, I have it set really pretty fast. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it reminds me a lot of those old kind of like, um, you know, Motown bass sounds and stuff. Uh, it has a similar quality to that, but uh, does an amazing job of evening that stuff out and just making the, the whole thing just feel stronger, like the notes just hold stronger because uh, they're sustaining um, so much more clearly. Um, so here it is without again. And it would be difficult for me to find a volume for this in the mix because the notes are kind of jumping around in level. Much, much easier to set a level with this. So there you go, there's some bass guitar with the Unfair Child. And I think, yeah, I only had one, one setting for that. All right, let's do, some, let's do some drum stuff here. Okay, so there, there's a few cool options here with this. Um, and let me just remember what, what I'm doing here. Okay, cool. So here's like a good basic just overall setting. If you're just going to take, you know, a whole drum mix um, and put it through uh, this thing, uh, it'll just sort of like thicken everything up and make it more aggressive and energized sounding. Um, but here's what this thing, we'll start with it unprocessed first. This is what this little drum part sounds like. This was a one mic drum, drum recording I did a while ago, just experimenting. It's just a single 251 uh, in front of the drum kit. Okay, so now here is with the Unfair Child. And then without again. So you really hear, you know, the difference of how the compressor is just pulling all of that ambience in between the hits forward. You hear more of the room. You hear more of the explosive sound of the drums. It's, you know, um, enhancing the aggressive attacks of the drums. Makes the whole thing just sound like it's being played harder. There it is with it again. I feel like uh, maybe just to get an idea of the range of adjustment. I'm just gonna show you kind of what this thing, I'm just gonna crank on these knobs while this drum loop is playing. So super fast attack, super fast release, we can go even further. So there it's just taking off the transients 
and pulling all the ambience forward, it sounds kind of like distortion because the attack and the release are modulating each other. So you can start to slow down the release a little bit. And then start letting more of the transients through. So we could go the other way. If you really want to like enhance the attack of the drums, you can do a slower. slower attack time. It'll just add a big solid smack to the attack of the drums. There's the original thing. There it is with enhancing the attacks more. This would almost be like a cool side chain kind of vibe. You can just add more. More attack. And also what with this other sort of setting with the faster attack, slower release, just set it more aggressively. So it's really just blowing up the signal. But do this as a side chain. So. And you can just add thickness. That's without it. So super, super versatile on drums. I mean, having the individual attack and release controls is kind of essential, you know, for um, uh, for using compressors on drums, just because of different tempos and the sort of density of the part or the complexity of the part really determines like how quickly you need to get in and out. Um, the attack time really controls like how much you're going to be enhancing the transient attack or how much you want to sort of smooth it out. Like, it's really essential um, to be able to con control attack and release individually insane wide range of adjustment on this thing. Um, so it's, it's an amazing, amazing drum compressor. Uh, I also have an example in here of just individual mics. Um, when I worked on uh, Death From Above record, um, that stuff, uh, when I was mixing that, I had um, like three unfair trials in the room and so I was using uh, unfair trials for the kick and snare uh, on that record and so this is a really cool example of that um, I'll, I'm gonna pull these settings up and, uh, and so we can check this out okay so this is kind of hilarious so um, the drums on this on this record and in particular this song um, were really designed to be kind of weird and tweaky sounding and so the, the the close mics sound, um, I mean, there's just no other way to put it. They just sound really bad. And so, <laughs> and so um, I painted myself into a corner that I wanted to have to fight my way out of in order to, um, you know, just get a more unique sound out of it. And so when you hear these sounds totally unprocessed, it's kind of hilarious. So, like, uh, I'm going to start with nothing on this stuff. Uh, so you can kind of get the idea here. It's really, really funny. Okay, so here is the kick mic, which I believe is a D20, with no, none of the processing on it. You know, and it sounds like what you'd expect, just a mic sitting in front of a kick drum. And so this part of the sound, I ended up doing some very aggressive uh, treatments on. So I wanted to just be this sort of like low mid punch kind of a thing. 
like that. And then a lot of distortion on there, like in the mids and stuff like that, make it give it this sort of knocky mid-range thing. <clears throat> and then I blended in this NS10 box. This is the version of the NS10 where it's still in the speaker box. It's gated. Although I think it might be cooler without the gate on there. Um, so that's those two things together. And then ultimately, they get EQ'd with this starts sounding a little more like a like a kick drum you can see I did a, a little timing adjustment there to try and get the phasing to be cool between the the NS10 and the kick mic so there's without the timing adjust there's with it you just hear it get deeper and so then I did a whole series of treatments on here and this all of this stuff is really made um, to ultimately to be compressed and so brightness even more brightness uh, a little more distortion on the blend a little more gating on there and all of this treatment was really designed in order to have the compression on it so now let's hear it with the compression that's the final sound. There it is without the unfair child. With the unfair child. So, I mean, the unfair child is making it work, you know, but everything is really sort of treated in order to have that kind of compression on there. Um, so that, yeah, because here's the unfair child. I did have to add a little bit of extra low end after the compressor um, to just make up for how it, uh, with kick drums, I, I basically, I always have to do, do that regardless of the compressor I'm using. It, once you compress it really hard, I always have to sort of, put some low end back in the signal afterwards. So that's the only difference between these two signal chains. There's some extra gain here just to get it to hit the compressor right. That's without the extra low end. Okay, so then I have a snare drum as well. And so the snare drum, we can hear the totally unprocessed version. Again, this was not really designed to be like a perfect snare drum sound from the beginning. It's designed to be kind of trashy. So there it is. There's some gating on there. Get rid of some of the cymbal wash. So I did put some distortion on there, radical EQ to try and get some body in there, more, more body in there. Okay, again, this is all designed in order to have the compressor respond right. So that's what it sounds like with the compressor on there. And I added a little extra mid-range after the fact on this one. Okay, so now... So there's both of them with the unfair child. There's without. And so it's just adding all of that smack, you know, to the to the snare drums, making it sound like he's just playing crazy hard, super aggressive. Um, and you know, if you can compare it, I don't think I have a way. Well, I can, I, yeah, I can kind of do this. You know, <laughs> that you can get an idea of how far these things came. Um, yeah. So here's this guy. We'll turn all this stuff off. So we went. That's the fun end, end product there. 
<laughs> That's where it came from. Yeah, so you get the idea. Um, so yeah, super. They're great for uh, super aggressive. And and again, I think because it's uh, being done with a bunch of tubes instead of a VCA or um, a FET or something like that, um, there's still there's something a little more organic sounding about the way this thing compresses when it's really clamping down on something. It just it just adds a little life to it when it's really clamping down on stuff. instead of, you know, having it sound kind of choked off. So, so really, really cool on uh, individual drum mics. All right, so then we got one more example here, some vocal stuff. So this was a thing that uh, was recorded recently. This is uh, Grace uh, with her band pr playing live in this big uh, courthouse um, uh, in uh, Sioux Falls, this amazing room. It has like a you know, five second reverb um, just in the room. And uh, this is her just on an SM7. Um, this is, was, was an instance where um, I just had a portable rig. It was just my laptop and this uh, Antelope um, Orion Studio. It has 12 mic pre's in it. And this was an instance where I just recorded everything totally flat, um, very conservative levels, just as transparent as possible, straight into the computer. And then when I got back here uh, to Topanga Dice, I ran stuff through tape machines and unfair childs and outboard EQs and all kinds of cool stuff um, to sort of, you know, add some color and, uh, you know, um, more life to the sound when, when I was here. Um, and it worked out great. So this is Grace's voice, totally um, uncompressed. Uh, I have a little bit of EQ on, on here. There's just a high pass and pulling out some low mid stuff. And, uh, and then this is like a dynamic EQ thing that I do a lot on hers for the, for the mid-range. Um, but other than that, there's nothing else going on here. Uh, let me get my settings together for this. And so this is going to be a, a ratio example. So we're going to go individual, go there, uh, all the way up there, and then about eight here. And we're variable again. And I think we're at, yeah, we're at two and two here. We'll hear it a as it went in. I'm going to leave the EQ and stuff on there. Um, and uh, you'll hear uh, uncompressed. Love is alive. It takes a hold. It'll change your life, make you lose control. You can't explain the things it does. But hearts are hard. That's cool. You really hear that um, that natural reverb in the room. Um, you know, there's there, there's no reverb added to that. It's off in the distance because she's you know on a close up microphone. But man, beautiful, beautiful sounding space. Okay, so here it is with the unfair child now, and it'll do you know what what you expect. Oh, the quiet stuff is going to get louder, and uh, and it's all going to be a more consistent volume. So this is with a very low ratio. So it's kind of compressing everything and just trying to even everything out. Love is alive. Stays up close. It takes a hold. Brings that reverb tail up. It'll change your life. Make you lose control. You can't explain the things it does. But hearts are hearts, and love is love. So um, obviously, evened out the level, 
um, I think it does an incredibly smooth job of um, when it's having to like grab that louder stuff and transition into the softer stuff that comes forward. Um, it just does it in a really natural way. Um, you don't hear it jerking the level around. And, um, and it also adds this beautiful um, high-end energy to her voice. Um, you know, like the soft parts that just have this amazing air and presence to them with the, um, the unfair child on there. So here's the, here's the other setting. I'm going to um, turn up the DC threshold. So here, here it is. I'm going to turn that up like that. And, uh, and I got to turn the threshold up in order to accommodate it. So it'll still be compressing roughly the same amount. But you'll notice that on the meter, like the loud parts are compressing similar to the way it's bef it, you know, where it was before, but the soft parts aren't getting compressed hardly at all. And that's the difference of the ratio. So check this out. Love is alive. Comes all the way up. Takes a hold. It'll change your life. Yes, yeah, so the end of that, no compression. Make you lose control. Barely any there. You can't explain. Yes, yeah, so all that, no compression the at all. The things it does. But hearts are hard. So it's kind of cool, you know, the, the soft stuff comes forward in volume and it's not going to compress at all and you hear all that beautiful, subtle um, dynamics in those softer moments. They get, it gets preserved more. And if I go back to, to this, the other setting, and I'm going to go to this, this quiet moment here. Check this out. So You can't explain. So... All of that softer stuff is still triggering compression. Whereas when I go like this, or something like this. You can't explain. The softer stuff is not getting compressed at all. You can't explain. But the loud stuff is still getting um, clamped down about the same amount. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's one of the things that I do, depending on, you know, how dynamic the vocal is, I really play with this a lot, um, this DC threshold control uh, for, you know, um, singers to just figure out how to get everything so it's in the right relative range to each other. And this allows me to really control how much it's going to grab the louder parts um, or how much it's just going to sort of gently even everything if I'm on the, the lower setting. Um, amazing vocal compressor. It's, it's one of the only ones that has become sort of my main, you know, I actually, I grab for this now first before my original uh, 1176 that, that I've loved so much for, for the last whatever it's been, three decades, <laughs> um, almost three decades. Uh, so this this guy has uh, been been winning out. So you know when it's time to record a vocal, I always just patch through this first. Um, and a lot of times I just put it on preset number one. Boom, good to go. Um, that's a, it's a great vocal preset. So I think that's it. That, those are all my audio examples, and um, that's a a really good uh, you know array of stuff um, trying to show you know how this thing performs on all over the you know different sources and whatnot I hope that wasn't too painful um, me <laughs> shilling my own stuff to you but um, but I really do genuinely love this box and uh, you know I use it all the time I've definitely um, you know at this point uh, it would be it would be tough for me to uh, to give it up you know I'm, I'm it's become a really you know like a fixture in my uh my workflow now so um so there you have it shameless um product promotion for undertone audio the unfair child 670m mark ii uh, on a whole bunch of stuff i hope there was something interesting in there for you 
and I will see you next time. All right, bye. You put the who's in on the what's in. Attach the what's in to the who's in. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacallit go. You hook the gidget to the gadget. Adjust the gadget to the gidget. Unhook the dingly dang from the diddly doo.